This is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we're glad in it. Let me begin this morning with expressions publicly of gratitude to the different personalities responsible for my being here during this esteemed Conga lectures on biblical preaching to Mrs. Conga. Bless you. And then to Dr. George for the invitation. And then to be here and to see different men and women who have assisted in the shaping of my ministry. I wouldn't call that name, but I know of the seriousness of this event. And so I want to say to Dr. Matthews, Dr. Thielman, thank you for your investment. And if my Old Testament today or New Testament go awry, blame them. <laughs> It's good to be home, to be back at Beeson, to be here among friends in this community, to see other persons who have shaped me along the way. For the next few days, I want to spend time with us in discussion about turning the preacher inside out. I've crossed the 50-yard line in age now, Strange what happens to you biologically and physiologically when you mature. I don't know what was happening. I had to go see Dennis Hamill, my physician for more than 20 years, retired now, and I said, Doc, it appears that the time clock is reversing itself. And he sent me through a series of tests And one of the last tests that he sent me through and to was to go take an MRI. I'd heard about these MRIs and the technicians and how they take bets on the side of who would pass out from fear of claustrophobia. (laughs) I asked the technicians actually when I went to be subsumed into this little tunnel what is the real purpose of an MRI? And they just simply said, we want to look inside of you, to look underneath you, beyond the obvious, to see what you can't see from the outside. And that's what I want us to do beginning the day is to put the preacher in a spiritual MRI, to look beyond the obvious, and to look inside of that which sustains the preacher by heart, head, and hands. We look inside the preacher primarily because the preacher has an inner life, a hidden life, an invisible self that no one else can see. It is that place where spiritual formation takes place. It is here in the quietness, the stillness, a place of contemplation, a most needed place. In fact, when we read the Gospels and we come to Mark 1, around verse 35, Jesus rises early, early earlier than his disciples before the sun peaks across the horizon and in a still, quiet, solitary place, he goes and he registers his heart to God. It is here where his vision for the kingdom is set. It is there where the will of God is clarified and defined. His disciples want to pull him back into the busy activity of ministry to get back to preaching and teaching and healing, but he wants to spend his initial moments in a time of prayer and contemplation. The preacher would never rise higher than their ability to pray, to pray. Real power and influence of preaching is born out of the quiet moments on your knees, in the presence of God, with the scripture open to you. Preachers ask me regularly now, what are you reading and what are you studying? And it's almost jokingly when you say the Bible, they almost chuckle at it and then they say, no, I'm serious, what are you really reading? There's nothing that you will read or ever will read in ministry that's more significant than the reading and the familiarity of the scriptures, getting to know them 
as your guide. The preacher's inner life then. It's a sacred space and a sacred place, a place of silence and a place of solitude. Once again, it is here where we are spiritually formed. And so I begin with the inner life, the heart, Aristotle would use in his famous trilogy of pathos and logos ethos. He would refer to it as pathos this morning as the heart. Henry Mitchell is very clever when he says that faith is often shaped more intuitively than by information. Look with me then at Mark chapter 3, beginning at verse 13, where Jesus calls his disciples to himself. He seems to be living out of those words, out of the heart flows the issues of life. And once again, he goes to the mountain to pray. And then he calls to himself those disciples that he wanted or those that he wanted to be with him. And they are to be with him before he sends them out to preach. Do you see that? To be with him before they are sent out to preach. This kind of with usness with Christ. To spend moments with him in silence and solitude before the Lord sends them out to proclaim the message of the kingdom. Here they are, and pay attention to the order. The impact of the order is significant. They are not to go out and preach and then come be with him. They are with him, and then they are sent out to preach. It's caught, not taught. There were some things that Jesus did not sit down and give a lecture about. They just caught it. It was embodied, incarnationalized in his preaching, in his teaching, in his healing. They caught it. It's said even now, Josh Bell, the famous violinist, he plays... Uh, one and a half, two million dollar Stradivarius violin. And even now, scientists are not able to determine how those Stradivariuses are really designed. This Italian craftsman would take his illiterate apprentices and they would go about, and according to, I guess, legend, he would thump the wood. Nobody's been able to replicate it. They, he would just thump it. And they wanted to know what was he listening for. He didn't know. He didn't know how to explain it. He just knew it when he heard it. That's what Jesus did with his disciples, and many times he does with us. I know that you think that you can logically deduce everything and you can come up with a rationality for everything in ministry. Wait until you get to it you'll discover that there are some things they're not taught, they're just caught. Out of this, let me look topically at three models. Two who were there at the mountainside that day. One who would be met later down the road as biblical illustrations of preaching that takes place out of the heart. The first would be Peter. The preaching out of a restored heart. Jesus meets Simon Peter. He's casting his nets. He appears first on all the Gospels in the order of the listings. The show's forth, I guess, his prominence. Simon, son of Jonah. He has a peculiar name in the Old Testament. It would mean dove, and a dove is a capricious, fickle, unpredictable bird. That describes the very life of Simon Peter. You didn't know what you were going to get out of Peter on a good day. Sometimes up and yes, sometimes down. But he called him nonetheless. He saw something in Peter. Jesus always seems to be more interested in what we can become than what we are, what we have been. 
and he called him to follow him, and he did. As scenes were unraveling the life of Simon Peter, there's a moment before our Lord's crucifixion where Jesus says to Peter, I have prayed for you because Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But when you have retraced your steps, strengthen those or strengthen the brothers. It was as if Jesus was looking ahead of Peter at his life of restoration of what he could become and what he would become. And sure enough, Peter would curse and deny and flee and run away and go back to what God had called him from. And the graciousness of the Lord Jesus Christ meets us back at that same place. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? There are still elements of arrogance and hubris in the life of old Peter here. You know I do, Lord. You know I do. More than these, you know I do, Lord. Maybe to erase the three denials that he had previously made. But then we see Peter preaching. Empowered, enveloped in the presence of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. Thousands of people respond to him. And you hear out of a restored heart, repent and be baptized. That's a restored heart. You find him in Acts 10 down at Cornelius' house. This is a restored Peter. Pre-Pentecostal Peter never would have gone down to Cornelius' house. But the restored Peter does, and he goes with such restoration that even Cornelius initially would bow down to worship him and listen to the words of the restored heart. You can't do that. I am too, but a man. This is what Clyde Fant describes as life's second greatest confession. The first greatest confession, Peter made it, didn't he? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now this is life's second greatest confession. I too am but a man. You can't make the second confession until you make the first confession. And it becomes a temptation in the life of every preacher to be more than a human being, to be deified, to be elevated to a place where God never intended you to be. I can say that now. I've served the church long enough to say that now. And if you're not careful, the people you serve will gladly elevate you to a deified position. But the restored heart, the mended heart, the heart that is brought back, will keep you in a place to which and to where you belong. Restoration takes time. It doesn't happen immediately. This is not some overnight experience. You know, the way we read it, Peter denies and then he returns and all that. It takes work and restoration, sometimes years of restoration. Several years ago, I was in Milan. I wanted to see the painting of the, the Last Supper, yes. And, and to see that painting hanging inside of that Milan Museum was beautiful. But I really didn't know what I was looking at. It was full of dirt and soot and smoke. All of the colors had been lost. And somebody said that a woman had given money for that Last Supper to be restored. You know how long it took? Not a year, not two. 21 years for a painting to be restored. I know. Listen, I do my work in the church and I preach to people all the time. And I know what you said. Well, if it takes that long, well, you just happen to be on the upside of life right now. Your day is coming too, where you'll need some restoration. And it won't take place overnight. When you are spiritual, Galatians 6 reminds us, restore those. Restore those. Mend those. Reset those. 
That's preaching out of restored heart. Paul comes along, and he symbolizes for me preaching out of a converted heart. I'm not saying that Peter was not converted. I am speaking that Paul's conversion dramatically influenced the way that he preached. On more than one occasion, Peter, Paul rather, would give an extended version of his conversion. Whether it be before the Jews in Jerusalem or the pagans or the Gentiles in Caesarea, he always pours out of his conversion. In fact, he stands before Felix and Festus and he gives his story. And he tells what happened to him dramatically on the road of Damascus. And the words come back, your story is so good you almost persuaded me to be a Christian. Paul, more than anybody, knew something about the dramatic encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And how did it show up? He says, a light and a voice. And it follows him through his preaching and his teaching. If anybody knew it, Paul knew it. Circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew. Concerning being zealous, he's a Pharisee. Concerning knowing the law unto his own personal righteousness. He said, nobody knows it better than I know it. But that law was no more than a mirror to give me a reflection of who I am, but the mirror couldn't clean me up. But the grace of God could. And that grace straightened him out. And everywhere he went, he could not help but tell his story to remind somebody of what the Lord Jesus had done for him. You read in Ephesians chapter 1, and that same word peeps out of the passage where the eyes of the heart have been enlightened. Where did that kind of language come from? It came out of his conversion. He was always looking in the rearview mirror, remembering that day when Christ got a hold of him. There's something about conversion. You don't hear people often anymore, almost ever, tell how they met the Lord when they met him, or the circumstances of their encounter. Every now and then you ought to tell it. I was 15 years old. I was flirting around with Islam, the nation of Islam. I liked it. I grew up in the ghetto of Houston. And so the nation of Islam provided for me a kind of community where I could express myself, where I couldn't do it at the church, I felt like. But somebody had been praying for me. I don't know who, but somebody had been praying for me. Something within just kept holding the reins. Something within I cannot explain. And I don't know, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't go all the way. And then when I was playing basketball in high school, Freddie Lewis came in with his little Gideon New Testament and read to me from Romans 10. He told me if I would confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God had raised Jesus from the dead, I could be saved. For with the heart, man, believe it unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I didn't move that day. Rufus Smith was a young Christian. I watched him, I admired him, but I didn't move that day. That summer, I don't know, I was just at my mama's house. I wasn't reading the Bible. I was just walking around. I got on my knees and said, Lord, whatever roof has got, I want it. And all I know is that I was saved that day. It's kind of like C.S. Lewis, right? He gets on his bike, he rides from the Oxford University community, one way unsaved, he comes back saved. Or Barbara Brown Taylor, when she made fun of those campus crusaders for Christ coming by her dormitory, knocking at her door, she let him in to entertain them to be hospitable. That Stanford University English literature student was paying no attention to what those campus Christians were talking about. She let him in. They read the four spiritual laws. She said, and asked her, do you want to pray the sinner's prayer? And kind of facetiously, she agrees, yes, I'll pray the prayer. She prayed it, they left. She fell on her dormitory bed, laughed, and went to sleep 
And Barbara Taylor said when she woke up, she knew she had been changed. You don't know how the grace of God would get a hold of you. How he'll reach you, how he'll come to you. Grace has that kind of effect upon us, doesn't it? That's the preaching out of a converted heart. A heart where you tell your story of what the Lord has done. Why wouldn't you want anybody to know what God has done for you? You ought to tell it sometimes. Every chance I get, I like to tell it. What a wonderful change in my heart he has wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy all my soul like seas bill rose since Jesus came into my heart. That's preaching out of a heart that knows it's been changed, a heart that's been regenerated. And a preacher that will preach will must, must preach out of a regenerated heart. But then finally, there's the preaching of the pastoral heart. I believe this is where John gets into the picture for me. We don't have any sermons of the Apostle John, none of him. We don't have them as we have for Simon Peter. We don't have them as we have sermons for Paul, but we can learn something, I think, from the life of the Apostle John and preaching out of a pastoral heart. Peter met Jesus casting nets, and he would live up to that image throughout his ministry of casting nets. John was met mending nets, and he would live up to the mending metaphor, that he would mend the church of the errors. In 1 John, or the first epistle of John, he writes to ward off Gnosticism. And then in Revelations chapter 2 and 3, he addresses all kinds of errors and discrepancies of the church. He does it pastorally. He mends the church, bringing the church back to its holiness. And what do you read by John in John's writing? He says things like this, my little children. That's a pastor there, my little children. You know, for years I always thought that the people came to church because they wanted to hear Pastor West preach. Initially in your ministry, the people may gather and come through the door to sit in the pews to listen to you talk about Jesus. But the real staying power, the sustaining power of church is when you can put flesh on what you talk about. You've heard people say it at times, people don't care how much you know, they just want to know how much you care. It may not be a verse in the Bible, but it might be something you want to tuck away in the manual of your pastoral ministry if you plan on entering it. People want to know, can you sit where they sit? Can you weep with them and rejoice with them? My little children, great legend of the church passed down that John, that John cared for the mother of Jesus in Ephesus for several years and then under the imperial reign of Domitian, he is sent to exile and there on an isle of Patmos at the apocalypse, he now writes to Revelation. He's sent back home to Ephesus and now he's planting churches around and he grows old now. He's getting older. And his sermons are simply this. My dear, dear children, love ye one another. It is said that as he got so old that he couldn't carry his own weight, he had to be brought into the church by his disciples and they would bring him in and that was his same statement, my dear children, love one another. Until his disciples got wearied with it and said, don't you know something else? Why do you keep saying the same thing? And he said it, my dear, dear little children, love you one another. For if you say these words, you said enough. As a pastor, I never thought that Christians had a real issue with love. I'm serious. I, I just thought all Christians just loved each other. But 
The pastor probably can't say it enough, love ye one another. There are some qualifications in pastoral preaching, isn't it? The minister becomes the preacher, the preacher, the pastor, the pastor, the shepherd, who shepherds some of the Lord's flock under the leadership of the chief shepherd. And there are two distinguishing qualifications that pastoral preaching must have. One is teaching the didache, that is, according to the teaching. There's an orthodox, historical, something canonical. I, I, I know this. I, I, I feel you. You're in seminary. You're reading different literature that says, look, man, nobody wants to get up in the words of Fosdick to hear anybody talk about the Amorites and the Jebusites. Don't fool yourself. If you can draw a line to how people behave, they might want to hear it. You'll be surprised what people will come to hear if you preach it with conviction and believability. But we have a set rule. The teaching, that's what we proclaim. But not just the didache, but the didacticus, and that is the teachings of the teaching. That every pastor should be able to preach, but beyond preaching, be able to confute those who come to contradict the teachings of the church. That's pastoral preaching. Not just how happy you can get people. It's to preach what the Bible says. Let me end this way by calling three witnesses to the stand here who've come through their MRI test, I think, quite successfully. One is Billy Graham. Graham said in 1970, I date this to show you how far back he said what he said. We recite it now, but in 1970 at All Souls Langham Place in London to 600 pastors, Billy Graham said, if I had my ministry to do all over again, I would prepare three times more and preach less. I preached too much and studied too little. Donald Barnhouse said it this way, if I had three years of ministry left in my life, two years would be for preparation, one would be for preaching. Dr. Gardner Taylor, that lion of the pulpit who convalesced now in North Carolina said it this way, I would read the Bible more and I would pray more. You take those names and consider what they say, you and I need a restored, converted, and a pastoral heart. When George Truitt, before he had reached real prominence as first Baptist pastor and had national, international acclaim, Baylor University wanted him to be the president of that school to direct it. Dr. Truitt prayed, and when he got off of his knees, he wrote, the trustees, those who had requested a simple line, and it was this, I have sought and I have found the pastor's heart. There's one who can restore us because he needs no restoration. There's one who can convert us because he's the one who converts us. There's one who can lead and shepherd us because he is the good shepherd. Now you go and turn your heart in the direction of God. Amen.